Hello and welcome to the historynetwork.org podcast. If you would like to become a patron of the podcast, just pop along to patreon.com forward slash history network and find out about how to become a patron there. Thank you to all our patrons who make this podcast possible. The History Network.org podcast, season 32, episode 6, The North West Indian War, part 1. This episode was written by Christopher Waters. Christopher is an armchair historian from New York City. He works full time for the United States federal government and continues his education online part time. He has a master's degree in criminal justice with a concentration in terrorism studies from John Jay College, a master's degree in military history with a concentration in American military history from American Military University, AMU, and is currently working on his master's in American history also from AMU. He grew up listening to and learning history from his World War II veteran grandfathers and his father, who let him watch all the classic history and war movies on TV. While his degrees are American history focused, Chris likes to learn about a wide range of world history subjects through listening to history-based podcasts, especially while training for whatever his next marathon is. At dawn they came, howling their war chants and cut through in the early morning mists. In the camp, men ready to their weapons in preparation of the horrors that awaited them. The unseen enemy had already killed several of their company in small, fast strikes when the invaders had searched for food and fodder. Now, along the bank of the river and behind their wagons, the final struggle would begin. In late 1791, during the Battle of the Wabash, also known as St. Clair's Defeat, saw the largest defeat of the American military at the hands of the Native Americans. Out of a force of about 1,000 men, the Americans suffered a 97% casualty rate, including 632 killed and 264 wounded. In addition, 200 camp followers, women and children included, were also killed against around 60 casualties on the Native American side. In a single morning, almost one quarter of the total United States Army was wiped out and the western frontier left wide open for further Native American raids. To understand this event and the rest of this story, we must understand the political landscape at the end of the American War of Independence and the signing of the 1783 Treaty of Paris. In this treaty, language was included to not only declare an end to the conflict, but to determine the post-war boundaries of the participants. The United States was given sovereignty of the lands east of the Mississippi River, and south of the Great Lakes, lands that were formerly under loose British control. Collectively known as the North West Territory, these lands combined most of the present-day states of Ohio, Indiana, Michigan and Illinois. However, neither nation consulted with the Native American tribes who lived in these lands for the past hundreds of years before redrawing the map, as was common practice in European expansion and politics. One of the major outcomes for the United States in their victory during the revolution was the new country was flat broke. Having maxed out its limited credit from European nations to arm and equip its soldiers to beat the British, the country now needed to start repaying those loans to maintain its credit and status on the world financial market. However, just having defeated a central government, in part, Due to its taxation policies, the American citizens were in no mood to pay taxes to a new federal government when cash on hand was extremely scarce. Many of the Continental soldiers were paid in land grants instead of hard cash as it was easier to transfer control of speculative, profitable land 
instead of trying to come up with gold or silver. Following the end of the revolution, many of these veterans now moved west to their given lands to begin a new life for their families and themselves. Also, to raise funds for the European granted loan repayments, the fledgling American central government decided to drastically cut the military budget and sell more of its newly acquired western lands to private citizens for cash at discounted prices. This and the prior settlement of the veterans led directly into conflict with the Native American tribes whose lands were being sold out from under them. Quickly, the American government realised it had an inability to defend the new settlers from native raids due to lack of an army capable of patrolling the frontiers. During the mid to late 1780s, an estimated 1,500 Americans were killed along the frontier along with an unknown number of natives in retaliation raids. This widespread devastation began to prevent continued migration and settlement of the Northwest Territory and thus the potential to stop the collection of cash for the sale of these lands by the American government. Following the passing of the Constitution of the United States and the election of George Washington as the first president, representatives of the settlers petitioned President Washington and his Secretary of War, Henry Knox, for soldiers to push back the Native Americans, mainly the Miami tribe under its chief, Little Turtle. Washington and Knox were receptive to the plight of the settlers, but were limited to the number of regular troops available due to the small size of the United States Army. The majority of the US Army was assigned to maintain and garrison forts and depots spread across the entire United States. To make up the numbers, Washington released funds to help pay for militiamen to supplement the regular army unit assigned to the American-occupied side of the Northwest Territory in what was then known as Fort Washington, now located in present-day Cincinnati, Ohio. The call for volunteers for the militia was only answered by around 1,100 men due to the fear of men leaving their homesteads for an extended time when there was the potential for crop failures and native raids while they were off fighting. The leader of the first expedition in 1790, Brigadier General Josiah Harmar, was forced to leave many men at supply bases to guard his food sources or to recover from the various sicknesses that seemed to break out whenever large bodies of soldiers gathered. Harmar opted to split his force into smaller raiding parties to attack villages and lands of the native Americans, but these were often ambushed by the Miami warriors who had the advantage of fighting on their own lands. During several weeks of off-and-on combat, the United States troops suffered around 350 total casualties versus about only 120 on the native side and resulted in Harmar retreating to Fort Washington. The first round of the Northwest Indian War was a decided Native American victory. The next year, 1791, President Washington ordered newly created Major General Arthur St. Clair to take up the post of Governor and Commander-in-Chief of the American forces of the Northwest Territory. The Native American Tribal Confederacy, spearheaded by the Miami Nation, was now joined by the Shawnee under Chief Blue Jacket and other tribes, including the Delaware, Ottawas and various smaller groups. To meet this increased enemy coalition, General St. Clair was authorised to expand the United States Army by enlisting a new regular regiment. However, due to low pay and the previous Harmar defeat, both regiments of the regular army were understaffed and had low morale. St. Clair was forced to rely heavily on locally recruited militias and units of six-month levies. Furthermore, when it came time to advance against the natives, desertion and discipline problems added to the slowness in which the campaign progressed. St. Clair, who by this time was suffering 
great pains from gout, saw his planned numerical superiority dwindle down, unknown to him, to numerical parity with the native army who continued to add to its ranks as the Americans advanced westwards. On November the 3rd, St. Clair's army camped next to the Wabash River. The force of about 1,100 Americans split into two camps on both sides of the river, one for the militia and the other for regulars and volunteers, located in a hilly field situated on the opposite side. The natives, led by Little Turtle and Blue Jacket, began to form out and slowly surround the American positions on three sides during the night of the 3rd. Their intelligence of the American dispositions was excellent from reports of their scouts and from some minor skirmishes that had taken place during the daylight hours. They were delighted with the lack of vigilance on the part of the Americans and from the lack of patrols sent out by the militia who were closest to the native positions. In classic Native American combat strategy, the Miami and Shawnee warriors attacked from the forest at dawn when the militiamen were just beginning their breakfast and other routine camp operations, causing sheer panic amongst the militia who fled without their weapons across the Wabash. The Native warriors followed behind. Alerted by the screams and firing, Across the river, the regulars hastily grabbed their weapons and formed lines of battle to meet the enemy. However, at this point, the remaining natives on the left and right wings flanked the regulars and attacked the main camp on that field on the hill. St. Clair rushed up his few artillery pieces to combat the flanking attacks, but their crews were mostly eliminated by native marksmen firing from behind trees. In desperation, a levee's battalion fixed bayonets and conducted a frontal attack to clear the native warriors to their front, but was sucked into a trap, surrounded, and nearly wiped out. As American casualties grew, the various units and leaders became more and more dejected and desperate. Frontal attacks invited slaughter, the artillery was knocked out, and the women and children amongst the camp followers were in danger of being completely surrounded by the attacking native warriors. General St. Clair decided to mount another bayonet charge, this time towards the rear to allow his remaining force a chance to escape down the road towards Fort Jefferson and safety. The natives wisely chose to not stand in front of the bayonet charge, but instead opted to attack the flanks and rear of the American column as well as slaughter the wounded who were left in the camp with the supplies in order not to slow the retreat down. However, the retreat quickly became a rout when the rearguard unit commanding officer was wounded and in an undisciplined fashion joined in the flight down the road. The Native Americans followed the army down the road for several miles, killed anyone who was too slow or too injured to make it to safety before returning to loot the camp of the Americans. It was a stunning defeat for the new American nation and its army. The result of the defeat affected all the participants in various ways. The Native American Confederacy warriors returned to their towns with their war trophies and in high spirits. With the American army so totally defeated, it gave the natives time to secure food for their winter stockpiles and its leaders the ability to debate the future choices of continuing the war or demanding a peace treaty from a position of strength. They also continued to receive advice and supplies from the British colonial government across the border in Canada. Loosely allied to the Confederacy, the British still supplied the natives with supplies and weapons to be used against the Americans as they had during the revolution. Their support came from the idea of creating a Native American buffer state between the United States to block future expansion westwards towards Canada and the Mississippi, even if the lands south of the Great Lakes were technically under American control from the Treaty of Paris. 
the British maintained a series of forts located within the Northwest Territory that served as trading posts, supply depots, and fallback positions of the Native Americans that the Americans were unwilling to forcibly eject from their claimed lands due to the weakness of the American army. On the American side, when word of the defeat and the massive loss of life reached the eastern states, panic and anger coursed through the population. President Washington grew furious at General St. Clair and forced through his immediate resignation without the need for a court-martial. A request by the United States Congress for documents to assist them in their investigation of the defeat led to many firsts for both Congress and the executive branch, including the creation of formal cabinet meetings, executive privilege and other separation of powers issues. However, Congress did shift some of the blame away from General St. Clair and onto Secretary Knox and the War Department due to the issues of supplying and raising new troops prior to St. Clair's defeat. This led President Washington to urge Congress to allocate the funds to increase military pay, establish a series of militia acts where the President had the ability to call out the militias of various states in times of need, and to require all able-bodied men between the ages of 18 and 45 to be enrolled in their state's militias, and finally, and most importantly, to reform and expand the army by the creation of the Legion of the United States. Round two had also gone to the Native Americans, but find out more next time what the future holds for both peoples. Thanks, Chris, for writing that episode for us. That's just part one. We're looking forward to part two in a couple of weeks' time. Thanks again to all our patrons who make this podcast possible. And if you'd like to join them and become a patron, just pop along to patreon.com forward slash the history network to find out about that there. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the history network dot org podcast written by Christopher Waters, read by Nick Barker.